it's probably easier to do a lot more work in software to just make the existing computer and the existing cameras work than it is to replace those. Like you can justify a lot of really smart engineering time on how do we just make whatever the latest version of the code is run on this old piece of hardware. 12.5, as far as we know, is still completely trained off completely hardware three data. So it has the data from those lower resolution cameras and that's the entire training model is still based off of hardware three. The only difference with 12.5 I mean, honestly, I don't know this for sure, but the only difference we're being told is the increase in parameter count. Um, so I'm saying with new efficiencies, they can they can stick a much more capable full self, full self driving computer into a Model Three car and still use the same camera setup and it and have it uh, be able to run these way larger parameter models if that's even needed. Got it. But I, and honestly, like I I lump hardware three and hardware four into the same kind of boat where I think, I don't even think hardware four is going to just be robo taxi everywhere in the U S all the time. Um, with the current camera setup, I think they definitely can both be robo taxi, but I think they're both going to be limited to certain areas. It's not until we see, um, I think like an actual robo taxi with like front bumper cameras and like zero blind spots directly in front of the car or around it and things like that, where I think, okay, maybe it can drive anywhere. Um, but yeah, but I, I kind of think of hardware three and hardware four in the same in the same way, I guess. I, I love your point about, you know, the older models being they were very large and they didn't perform all that well. Like if you think about the biggest model of GPT three, for example, versus GPT four point oh mini, like four point oh mini is cheaper to run, faster, better. Um, and I believe it's a smaller model than uh, at least one of the previous, definitely smaller than GPT-4, uh, potentially smaller than even GPT-3 or 3.5. Um, someone correct me in the comments because I'm not exactly sure on full parameter counts on those. But one that I am a little bit more familiar with is, you know, if you look at the meta models, you've got the Llama 3, especially now Llama 3.1, 8B is 8 billion parameters. And it is a far better model than Llama 2 that was 70 billion parameters. So like there's an 8 billion, a 70 billion, and then a larger version for Llama. And the smallest Llama 3 model is better than the medium-sized Llama 2 model, basically on every metric. And so that shows us like we can get better performance out of less neurons, less parameters. And you know, I think this is a trend that's going to continue. So here, my little tweet, it just says that there are many strategies to get better performance out of a neural net. Uh, some of the most common ones are you improve the objective function. You get better at telling the neural net exactly what you want to achieve. And the better you do at that, the better that the thing performs overall because it knows exactly how to tweak all of the, the parameter weights to achieve that goal. And the second one is you train on better data. You just have more diversity or better examples or, you know, whatever. There's so many different ways to train on better data. You can train with more compute. You can train with the same compute for longer to achieve the same thing. Like all four of those strategies are very common ways to get a better performing neural network. And all four of those ways produce a model that has higher signal to noise ratio. So that means better performance with less parameters. And then... Number five is you can just add more parameters to the neural network. And that's where instead of getting a higher signal to noise ratio, you do increase your performance, but you're not increasing it necessarily as fast as you're increasing the number of parameters. So your signal to noise ratio actually goes down. And the way that I kind of think about that is like you're shining a bright flashlight into a dark room as you're looking for what are the functions that are going to be like, what's going to be possible here? And like we're going to find some interesting new features or capabilities in this dark room that we're exploring as we're trying to figure out how to build these neural nets. And then once you figure out, okay, this is a thing that's possible, then that tells you, okay, now I can do that. Let's figure out how to do the same thing with a lot less neurons so that we can bring that signal to noise ratio back down um, and have higher signal, yeah, and less noise. That way, because when your signal to noise ratio is bad, it's just a harder model to run. It's more expensive in terms of energy, in terms of everything. And so it's like the it's the first 
brute force way that you throw, you know, spaghetti at the wall to find stuff, but you don't want to do that like long-term. And that's in my mind, what Elon is doing here with increasing this parameter count by five times is he's looking for like, let's find where this thing actually works the best it can possibly work. And then once we get that, then we can use some of these other four. And then there are, you know, there are more strategies besides these as well. You know, if we get architectural, like these are all things that they can definitely do. They're going to have more training compute. And they can definitely even throw a larger amount of training compute for more time on the same exact data and get better performance in less parameters. So like these are all things that are available to them without any sort of breakthroughs. Then we seem to be consistently getting breakthroughs in architecture that let us get higher quality models in the same exact footprint as well. And then, you know, as James was talking about, that's all on top of, you know, these neural nets are running a layer of software that's at like the top level of abstraction of everything that we know in software. And they're built on, you've got to have CPU code and then you've got to have GPU code on top of that. And then you get to your neural code and there's possibilities for optimization in all of those layers for a specific piece of hardware that is like, that's my interpretation of what Elon has been saying here about hardware three is that we need to do more work on getting, I don't know if it's the NPU code optimized so that that's running the matrix math a little bit tighter, or if potentially it's, you know, we're overflowing our GPU or we're overflowing our CPU in order to keep up with the rate that we're processing this data. Um, somewhere in there, I think, is where Hardware 3 is having a struggle right now. Um, and and I, all of that to say, there's so many different opportunities and options for Tesla to continue to improve the functionality of the FSD stack and to get it to fit on Hardware 3, much less, you know, Hardware 4 and in the future models. Like, we just have a lot more room left to grow functionality. Um, and so, yeah, all of that is just a long kind of technical way to explain that I 100% agree that this is something that's going to be possible. It just takes more time. And so hardware four is probably going to be the place where we spend a little bit more time to figure out what's possible. And then as we discover, like hardware four will become the bleeding edge of the research, but it should back propagate to and become backwards compatible with hardware three over time. Okay. So let me, let me say back what you said in my stupid brain and see, tell me if I got it right, okay? So a, an analogy that I'm thinking through is in an organization, you have say 100 people, right? And typically your top 20% are gonna do most of the work versus your bottom 80%. This more parameter thing, the way I'm thinking about it as you were saying that is, okay, it's, it's very similar to that where if you think of people as parameters, like more variables to use to try to solve something, the bottom 80 are going to do less work than the top 20, like are, are going to create less value than the top 20. Is that a right, like the correct way of thinking about it? Just because you have more of something doesn't mean that it's actually better. Yeah, well, and I'll let's take that analogy a step further. Say, okay, hey, we've got, we've got 100 people, 20 of them are rock stars, 80 of them are meh. We want to get to 40 rock stars. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to hire another 100 people. And then we're going to have to fire ah. about 60, you know, 100 of those people over. Like, we're going to take the top 20 in the new 100, and we're going to keep the top 20 from the old 100. And then we're going to fire the bottom 100. Got it. So you're finding the right parameters. Yep. You're trying to find the right parameters. So, okay. So uh, an increase in parameters doesn't mean you're going to use all the parameters long term. You're just finding what parameters are actually the most valuable for the model essentially yes okay so that that makes a lot of sense okay and then around the point of backwards compatibility or saying like say hey the hardware is not going to be up to par and so sort of as jd was going through this is kind of got me thinking if robo taxi is as valuable as we think it is what is the percentage of the cost relative to the total revenue that car can create if it's self-driving so like let's say the chip or the computer costs two grand but that car is able to make $10,000 for Tesla in the long term or $20,000 or $50,000, just, just give the computer for free. <laughs> like it's in, it's in Tesla's best interest to have self-driving Teslas out there, right? So it's almost like from that perspective, as long as the camera suite is good enough 
for it to to perform that from a resolution level and from a placement level, right? So then from a strategy perspective, regardless of where this goes, and 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 there will be upset people, let's say if hardware three can't do it, there are paths for Tesla to solve this relatively easy, in theory, if what we're talking about is correct. Yeah, I would say absolutely. Like the the cost of upgrading those computers, if that's even needed, will be pennies on the dollar if it actually can be a robo taxi. Um, just like Han's car, he has a 2018 Model 3 that didn't ship with a full self driving computer. That was something that was added in, um, you know, when it was released uh, a little bit later. So if you look at what 100 watts of compute would get you, I don't know, 10 years ago versus what 100 watts of compute would get you now, um, it's a lot. You know, obviously, it's more. You know, we can fit a much larger computer on the same amount of uh, power. So, I think that if that's needed, I think it'll be a no-brainer because it's literally a computer they could swap out behind the glove box. And even the cameras could be like you. The only thing you just have to have stable interfaces. So the if there needs to be a new computer, it needs to have the exact same plugs and all the interfaces, like the same power, everything, as the old computer. But then you can upgrade it, you know, to all new components on there. And then the cameras would need to plug into the exact same plugs. If you're talking about, hey, Mr. Supplier, I'm going to order. There's like 2 million plus hardware three computers on the road. And so, like, if you're ordering 2 million units, I'm pretty sure you can specify whatever form factors that you need for those interfaces. And that's something that, you know, in the worst case scenario can be done. But obviously that is going to be expensive. And I think that James Dalma's point comes back in here that if it's probably easier to do a lot more work in software to just make the existing computer and the existing cameras work than it is to replace those. Like you can justify a lot of really smart engineering time on how do we just make whatever the latest version of the code is run on this old piece of hardware in yeah, I mean, just think about how insanely optimized video game code had to be back in the day when you're running on like an Atari or an original Nintendo. Like all that stuff is written in straight assembly because you don't have any extra room to do anything. And like every every task or functionality or move or piece of graphic or piece of music that you add in is literally taking away from functionality somewhere else. Like that is how optimized code can get if you're willing to put in enough work. And we're like so far away from that with the current versions of FSD code. Like it is just like in comparison to writing straight assembly code, it's bloated by a hundred or a thousand times compared to that. And so you can you can do a lot to shrink that down in wh wherever your bottlenecks are in order to get it to fit on that computer and run with those um those constraints if you're just willing to spend enough engineering time to do that. Yeah, and to be clear, I think you're 100% right and I think that they will solve it with the current 3 hardware. I'm talking a like the worst case scenario that I can think of for hardware three is really not that worst case of a scenario because yes, yeah, I agree. Um, if, if it's required upgrading, those computers would be insanely expensive, but if robo taxi is solved, nothing will be too expensive for Tesla. Like I, it'll like people aren't understanding what it would mean if a car can actually drive itself with nobody in the front seat. Um, all like the, the value is just insane. Like no, nothing will be too expensive. They could upgrade all those cars and it would be like a penny, like in the long run. So contextualize for us 12.5 within the context of Tesla solving autonomy and getting to robo taxi. Why are we all so excited? Yeah. So, um, to be Okay, so it's this is kind of it's going to be tough to explain, honestly, it, it's very tough to to get across in words how it feels inside the car. It's uh, if you have anybody around you that has 12.5 right right now, I highly recommend just going for a ride because you'll immediately understand. Um, it's the way that it seems to be able to predict the future better than ever before. And it's control. It's like it's not reacting to anything anymore it's it's just um it it kind of 
I, I don't know. It's just the it it makes you understand that it truly knows what it's doing. Um, there was some question marks with previous versions. Like I was very vocal in my feedback of 12.4 that um that I was a little bit nervous in the direction that it was going because it was obeying laws and doing a few things better, but it was also very jerky and had some very harsh steering inputs and made it seem like it didn't actually understand the concept of driving. Um, I mean, not that it didn't understand the concept of driving, just that it wasn't a very good driver. But 12.5 is an extremely good driver. It's it's anticipating things way better than like anybody that I drive with. When I'm sitting in the passenger seat, I'm the worst passenger ever because I'm like constantly monitoring what they're doing. And version 12.5 is the, the first version. And we're seeing that feedback on X is that people can sit back and not think about it. That little red flag that pops up in your head when like the Uber driver does something weird isn't popping up anymore. Um, when it's deciding to do something, it doesn't second guess itself and just continues through. Like those examples of the, the pedestrians that I had and the way it uh, moves through them in a way that they understand. Like nobody gives the car a second look for doing something weird anymore. And it's those small things that really add up to something huge with 12.5 where it's like finally um it like in my opinion 12.5 is proof that it's very easily solvable with more time 